So welcome everyone. Welcome to Deconstructing Leg Pain. On tonight's webinar, we're gonna discuss how to identify the source of leg pain and the different causes. Our speakers today are HSS physiatrist, Dina Barsoom, and HSS physical therapist, Brian Goonan. All right, so let me end this poll. We have some, a lot of New Yorkers, some New Jersey people, some Connecticut people. All right, and I can have you um, get started, Dr. Barson. All right, great. So I'm just going to share my screen here. All righty, great. Hopefully you guys can see that. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to talk about deconstructing leg pain. Um, leg pain is a very broad topic, and there's a lot of different joints in the leg and muscles and nerves. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a couple of common um, sources of pain um, at each joint that we'll probably discuss a little further based on your questions. So starting with the hip, the hip is a ball and socket joint. The socket is the acetabulum. The ball is the head of the femur or the thigh bone. Hip impingement and hip osteoarthritis can both present usually with groin pain or pain at the front of the hip and limited range of motion of the hip. Hip impingement can um, kind of to simplify, it can come from overgrowth of the socket or from extra bone formation on the head and neck of the femur or the thigh bone, whereas hip arthritis is wear and tear and loss of cartilage, which is the cushioning inside the joint. Um, greater tokenteric pain, as opposed to that, is pain mostly on the outside of the hip. Um, a lot of times we refer to that as bursitis, meaning inflammation in the area. Sometimes there really is bursitis, but most of the time it's actually just wear and tear of the tendon and a little bit of weakness of the glutes. So those are uh, treated very differently. The knee is a hinge joint made up of three bones, your femur or your thigh bone as it connects to the tibia or shin bone, and then the patella or kneecap sits in the groove of the femur. Patella femoral pain is a common source of uh, pain, especially in younger people or in athletes a lot of times where the undersurface of the patella or the kneecap gets irritated and that's often treated with stretching of the side of the thigh and strengthening of the glutes. Um, meniscal tears, we, there are two menisci in each knee, which are uh, cartilage, cartilaginous soft tissue structures that provide more uh, cushioning to the knee joint. Uh, a tear in the meniscus can cause pain or swelling in the knee. And one important thing to look for is locking where the knee joint gets stuck. Um, and then ligament injury, there's a lot of different ligaments in the knee. You know, probably the most commonly talked about one is the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, which is uh, running inside the knee along with the PCL. And then we have ligaments on the outside and the uh, inside of the knee as well. Uh, a common, uh, common complaint of someone who has a ligament injury would be instability of the knee. The ankle um, is made up of three bones, the tibia and fibula and the shin coming together with the talus in the foot. Uh, there are a lot of ligaments on both sides of the ankle that provide a lot of stability. Most of the time, an ankle sprain is an inversion injury where the ankle turns in, and that can cause injury to the ligaments on the outside of the ankle, oftentimes associated with swelling, pain, and instability as well. The Achilles tendon is the big tendon at the back of the ankle, and that can be associated with pain and swelling. Um, there's risk of tear or even rupture of that Achilles tendon. And then it's also important to think about the big picture. Um, I see a lot of patients with back pain and issues in the back like a herniated disc or pinched nerve can cause pain, numbness, tingling, weakness in the leg. Um, and each nerve has a specific distribution. So depending on which nerve or nerves are involved, um, you may see pain or numbness or tingling in the leg. And then peripheral neuropathy is a disease of the nerves themselves. Usually that starts with pain or burning, tingling, numbness that starts in the toes and then travels up. Um, usually happens on both sides at the same time, can be related to diabetes or uh, drug exposures, but sometimes happens idiopathically, meaning we don't know why it's happened. So that's just a very quick overview, certainly not an all-inclusive list, but just wanted to get us started with some, uh, some things that are common sources of pain, and we'll get into our discussion. Welcome, everybody. Um, 
<laughs> My name is Brian Goonan. I work with Dr. Barsoom. I have the pleasure of working with her at the HSS Westchester office. And even though I don't see her anymore because of the pandemic restrictions, I see her notes every day. And um, we refer a lot of patients to each other. So if you understood all of what's on the slides, please send your resume in. If you don't understand it, that's totally okay. We're going to try and provide some color to all of those facts that we just spoke about. Um, so we'll start with the, about 10 or 11 scripted questions, and then we'll have some time for any questions you guys have, it looks like we have over 70 people in the group chat already. So um, ask away in the group chat, we'll, we'll um, add those in. If anyone wants to unmute and ask, that's okay too. And be as specific or as general as you feel comfortable. So we'll start with the first question. Uh, Dr. Barsoom, is there a way to differentiate whether leg pain is due to like a general ache and pain or something more serious? Yeah, so some important things to look for, you know, we all can have aches and pains if you do a new activity or you're sitting at a desk for a long time or even during the pandemic and people working from home, you know, in less than ideal ergonomic environments. So aches and pains are normal to experience. Some kind of uh, red flags to look for are pain or difficulty with weight bearing. So if you're having trouble walking, that's, you know, can be a sign of something more serious. Um, weakness is really important to think about. And sometimes weakness can be hard to differentiate from pain. If something is painful, it might feel weak, but true neurologic weakness is something that you want to get evaluated um, very quickly. Swelling of a joint can be indicative of um, sometimes a more serious injury, especially if it's hot and swollen at the same time. Um, general you know, muscle aches and pains, if they're relatively mild, they don't really limit activities, they get better within a couple of days, are usually not bothersome. But if a pain persists for a long time, if it makes it hard to bear weight, or if it's associated with redness or swelling of a joint, sometimes those can be signs of something a little bit more um, serious. And so it sounds like duration is a big thing. And it definitely, yeah. we, when we ask how long this has been going on, we have anything from oh, a couple of weeks to, oh, you know, 20 years. We're like, yeah. what? Yeah, we hear it all. And certainly, you know, hopefully people aren't living with severe pain for all that time. Um, but some of these kind of more wear and tear things can certainly develop over time. And a lot of times patients will say, you know, I was hoping it would go away or I tried to take some over the counter medications, um, tried to manage it on my own. But if a pain persists for weeks and months, then certainly something, of course, worthwhile to get evaluated. Um, and sometimes when something is really, really severe, it's important to get it checked out sooner than later than even waiting that long. Oh, thank you. All right. So the next question, what are some symptoms of arthritis? I'm sorry you had that on your first slide. And I knew you were going to save some more information for now, but like, yeah. what does arthritis feel like? Yeah. So arthritis in general, arthritis can happen in any joint in the body, right? So in the Lower limb, we usually think about the hip, knee, and ankle. There's also a lot of small joints in the foot that can all develop arthritis. You can get arthritis in the lower back. So any joint in your body can develop arthritis. And arthritis is basically wear and tear of cartilage. Cartilage is the soft tissue cushion on the end of joints. And um, whether that's from an injury that can lead to more rapid progression of arthritis or just wear and tear over time. Some people, I think there's a genetic component to some people are more prone to developing arthritis than others. So depending on which joint is involved, the symptoms will be different, but, I'll, you know, kind of in broad strokes, symptoms of arthritis can be limited range of motion and swelling and pain, of course, in the hip, most often hip arthritis pain presents with pain in the groin, but that's not all the time. So it doesn't have to be in the groin. A lot of times we'll pa patients will make a C-shaped motion. They'll grab their hip and say, oh, it's right. It's deep inside my hip. That can be an indication that it's from arthritis. In the knee, like we talked about, the three bones that come together, the most common area to get knee arthritis is at the medial compartment or the inside portion of the knee, the part of the knee that's facing the other. So a lot of times the pain can be localized there but not all the time. Sometimes even if the arthritis is localized to one area, the pain can be more generalized. Um, in the ankle, it can be pain at the front or on either side, and usually with weight bearing. So in general, symptoms of arthritis would be pain, limited range of motion, potentially swelling of the joint. A lot of times arthritis pain is better when you're resting. So if you're not bearing weight, but when it gets severe, it can be, um, it can be painful at rest too. 
Um, it's also pretty painful or stiff after you've been immobile. So sometimes patients will say when they first get up in the morning, they have a lot of stiffness or if they've been sitting in a car for a long time and then they get out, you know, hip arthritis or knee arthritis can become particularly symptomatic at those times. Okay. And then, so we spoke about joint and that's like arthritis is locally just to a specific joint, like a knee or, <clears throat> or a hip or an ankle. Um, what does tendonitis feel like and how is that different? Great. So tendons are what connect muscle to bone. So that's how the muscle can act to move the bone is by the tendons connection. Um, tendon pain usually is also worse with activity. So during walking or exercise or stairs, um, that pain oftentimes can be localized to where that tendon attaches. So in the hip, the most common would be tendonitis or weakness of the gluteal tendons that attach at the side of the hip at the greater trochanter. So, so many times patients come in and say, I have hip pain, I bet I need a hip replacement. And then we examine them and they have great hip range of motion and we do an x-ray and they don't have hip arthritis at all, but they have such weakness and wear and tear of that gluteal tendon. So tendonitis pain is usually, can be localized to that area, although certainly pain can refer. Um, usually it's worse with activation of the muscle that that tendon controls. Okay. Um, I also know that we speak with our patients about the tendon hangover. Like you might not even feel the pain that day, but if yeah. you feel it the next day, it's yeah. probably what you were doing the day before. Um, yeah. And so that can be, that can be like a relatively more uh, benign thing. Like you pushed it a little bit harder at the gym or you did a different activity. And so you have that muscle or tendon soreness that improves, or it can be, you know, a sign of something more serious if the pain is more intense or if it doesn't get better in a, a short period of time. Okay, so we'll go, go on to the next question. Um, how do you know if the leg pain is coming from your spine, like sciatica or stenosis, or if it's actually in the leg? It, that's, you know, that's probably what I spend most of my day doing, because about half my practice is seeing people with back pain, and then about the other half would be other peripheral joints. Um, so in general, spine pain that travels down the leg is uh, usually from a pinched nerve. And so when you come see a doctor about it or when you think about your pain, we'll ask different questions about the quality of the pain. Sometimes spine pain or nerve pain can be more nerve in quality, meaning it's more burning or tingling, but not all the time. It can be a sharp or achy pain as well. Um, pain that travels down the leg that extends beyond the knee is oftentimes an indication of pain referred from the spine. So for example, hip pain can travel down the leg too, but usually hip pain, if it's referred, stops at the knee. But if the pain is traveling further down the knee into the lower leg or foot or ankle, sometimes that can be an indication that it's referred from the spine. You can have a pinched nerve in the back and not have any back pain and just have leg pain. So sometimes I have to kind of convince a patient that the pain that they're feeling really is coming from the spine and not something local. Um, so I spend a lot of time with patients, especially the first time they're coming in to ask a lot of questions about, you know, how long has the pain been going on and what makes it better? What makes it worse? That can give you a lot of clues about the pain. And then the physical exam is really important. So the, the spine and hip, there's a lot of overlap between the two. So if their hip range of motion is really very good, but they might have altered sensation or a change in their reflexes side to side. So those are some of the things I would check on a neurologic exam of somebody that I'm checking uh, for lower back pain or referred pain, then that would indicate that it's probably not the hip and it's actually the spine. Whereas if I could reproduce their range of motion with activation of, a, uh, I'm sorry, if I could reproduce their pain with activation of a muscle or range of motion of a joint, that could point me more in the direction of uh, the joint being a source of pain. One important thing to think about is I tell patients a lot, I'm treating you and your pain, not necessarily what your x-ray or your MRI shows. The more we take a look with imaging, especially in the lower back, as we get older and older means 25, right? And older, the more you look, the more you'll start to see some degenerative changes in the spine. So it's important to, you know, really understand what you're looking for and then use the imaging as a supplement to what you've already figured out with your physical exam. If I treated everything I saw in patients, x-rays and MRIs, people really wouldn't be getting, um, getting better. I think that's one of the more remarkable things about when people send, cause I've been doing this for 21 years now. I used to only get people who had very 
benign x-rays and now i get x-rays that are like really bad or mris that are really bad relatively and they're like no this is a physical therapy thing not i'm like mm-hmm. you sure like this looks yeah. pretty, oh, no it's physical yeah. therapy cool yeah um so obviously like um as humans we weren't given like a, a, a how to fix book we weren't given like instructions on what to do and it sounds like we could have pain that doesn't actually come from the source that it could be coming from somewhere else so how do we know when it's time to see a doctor for the leg pain yeah so i think there are kind of two categories right so a mild pain that doesn't get better with modification activity or a little bit of over the counter medication and lasts for you know 6 weeks 3 months at that point i would definitely want to see a doctor to be evaluated because sometimes it doesn't take a lot to solve it you know a little bit of modification to activity changing your shoes an orthotic um, physical therapy to teach you some exercises simple exercises to do at home can you know make the pain go away so on the more mild side of things, if a pain persists for, I I usually say greater than six weeks, but certainly by three months. Um, On the opposite side, if it's a really acute pain, it's important to be seen because sometimes there's some medicines or exercise that we can prescribe, or sometimes even an, an injection acutely that can help treat that acute pain. And then red flag symptoms are like we talked about, weakness, difficulty weight bearing, any loss of control of urine or stool, that can be a sign of, more, of a more serious nerve impingement. Um, something called saddle anesthesia. So if you lose sensation in the groin, like I usually tell patients when you wipe after you go to the bathroom, that shouldn't feel numb or tingly down there ever. So if any of those red flag symptoms certainly would be reason to see a doctor very quickly. Um, so I'd say if it's a mild pain that doesn't get better with you know usual you know rest, um, anti-inflammatories, that kind of thing, activity modification, or a more severe pain or any red flag symptoms would be time to see a doctor or a practitioner. Okay. Um, so adding more um, uh, information to the whole pot of information we're making here, um, is it possible for your leg pain to have more than one source? For sure. And that's really important when you see a doctor um, that they're not just evaluating the joint you come in. So let's say you come in with knee pain. If I don't examine your hip and your ankle, I'm not doing a complete job. Um, I always examine the lumbar spine anytime a patient comes in with any sort of leg pain issues. Um, So I think the lumbar spine is important to think about all the time, but it's very important to always assess the joint above and the joint below uh, because of referred pain for one. And second, the biomechanics. So if I have limited range of motion of my hip, that's going to affect my knee and ankle. So even if I have an ankle arthritis problem, if I have limited range of motion or weakness of my hip, if I don't address that, I might be going in circles and my ankle might not get better. Um, I, I mentioned patellofemoral pain in the knee. So the common thinking in the past was the treatment for that would be to strengthen the quadriceps. And then we realized if we look upstream and strengthen the glutes, we can solve our problems that way. So absolutely it's possible to have pain coming from more than one joint. Um, It's possible for the biomechanics or limitation in range of motion or weakness of a joint in one area to cause pain downstream or upstream. Uh, So it's important that your doctor um, or your therapist is evaluating uh, the joints above and below your problem area as well. Cool. All right. So we're going to go on to now we have all this information about what it could cause. Let's go into like some of the ways to prevent and treat it. Um, Is there anything you could do in your day-to-day life that would help prevent leg pain? Absolutely. So in general, what I tell patients, the best ways to slow the progression of arthritis and decrease pain are maintaining a healthy weight and being active. So the solution to pain is not to sit on your couch and not move, right? That's the opposite of what you want to do because then the weaker you get, the more pain um, and injury you are susceptible to experience. So in general, uh, maintaining a healthy weight. And sometimes that, you know, I see patients along all of the spectrum, right? So if a patient is overweight and coming in with knee pain, and we'll talk about weight loss as a part of their treatment plan, it can be hard to lose weight when you're in chronic pain. And then when you're in chronic pain and you're less active, you tend to 
put on more weight. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. I tell patients that for the knee, for example, every one pound that you lose is four pounds less force that your knees experience. So it doesn't have to be a terribly dramatic amount of weight loss to provide you pain relief. If you lose five pounds, that's 20 pounds of relief for your knees. Similar in the hip, it's about one to two. So maintaining a healthy weight and finding exercise that you enjoy doing so that you'll keep doing it. And I think it's important to cross train um, so that you're training your muscles and ligaments and joints to act under different circumstances. So you're not just running or just cycling or just doing Pilates or just doing weight training, but finding a combination of things to keep all of your muscles strong. Um, and that's the goal of physical therapy. When I send a patient to physical therapy, I always tell them the same thing. If you just go to physical therapy twice a week for six weeks, you're going to feel better. But if you stop and you go back to your old habits and you don't pick anything up, you're going to be back to see me again. And I'd rather, I love my patients, but I'd rather not see them again. If they get all better and I go out of business, then I'd be pretty good. Uh, maybe not to that extent. Um, but uh, the goal is to learn the right exercises that you can do without needing a lot of equipment, without taking your whole day up doing exercises, but finding the right things, learning the right things to target your problem areas, and then also finding exercises that you enjoy doing so that you'll keep up with it uh, for your general health and for your musculoskeletal health. I'll tell, I tell patients that the same way you brush your teeth every day to keep your smile healthy, you need exercise and movement on a very regular basis to keep your spine and your joints healthy. Well, so... Is there anything you like to see in a physical therapy program? Is there anything you like to see patients doing um, to either strengthen or stabilize to um, aid in the prevention and aid it from coming back? Yeah, I think I prescribe physical therapy all day long. As you know, you get my prescriptions all day long, I'm sure. Um, and I tell patients about how great physical therapy can be and how successful it can be. And I usually tell them there's three, I love the number three, there's three uh, keys to success with physical therapy. First is starting off with the right diagnosis and prescription. So that's what I try to do. Second is uh, finding a good physical therapist because not all physical therapy is out there. That is very good. Just the same as not all doctors that are out there are very good and not all car mechanics and used car dealers are very good. Um, so finding a good physical therapist, and I'll talk about what that, what I think that is, um, in a second. And then the third, most important, I think part of the recipe is a good patient who goes to physical therapy, buys into the program, and then picks up those exercises for home. In general, I think good physical therapy is exercise based. If you go to physical therapy and you get a hot pack and a massage and electrical stim and you ride an exercise bike, and then you get an ice pack and they send you on your way, you're going to feel great for an hour or two, or maybe that night, and then you're right back where you started. So all of those things are temporary and it can be okay as a portion of your physical therapy program. But in general, I want it to be exercise based. I want the physical therapist to be supervising the patient doing the exercise. I want them to be teaching them exercises to do at home, starting from the very first visit and then asking them to demonstrate the exercises. Okay, let's modify your form this way. Okay, you've mastered this. Let's take it a step further. Let's progress to a more dynamic exercise. So in general, I'm looking for exercise-based physical therapy, and I'm looking for the patient to kind of buy into that and participate actively going to their physical therapy sessions and then making it a part of their routine at home. So, and to elaborate a little bit on physical therapy that we do here at HSS, we look at things from like three different perspectives. We look at exercise activity and that's there's a subset of specific exercise or general exercise right do you need a specific exercise to unlock that hip or unlock that knee or strengthen that quad or strengthen that glute or can we do a general exercise like a general strengthening hey yeah, it's good get back into yoga get back into pilates something more general and then one of the things that we don't um get taught really in school and we kind of develop this as we come along is the non-exercise activity you know are we just you know uh working out at a spin class, doing a high intensity, and then sitting on the couch and um, chowing down on a sugar-filled smoothie right after that, because that could totally erase all of the progress you made. Um, do you get up and walk? Do you do spin classes, but only hit like 3,000 steps a day? That non-exercise activity has a huge impact, and most of our calorie burn is during that. So we speak about that a lot um, more than we used to. Um, going on to um, <clears throat> the different types of uh, doctors and treatments and stuff like that, when you have a patient come in with leg pain, can you just take me through like how you know whether they go for PT or an MRI or an injection? Yeah, so 
the questions I'll ask the patient, I think before I look at any sort of imaging that they've brought in or any x-ray or anything that we've done on the day of the visit, the bulk of my time is spent asking them questions and then doing a physical exam. So things I ask for in history, you know, a lot of things that we've talked about, how long have you had the pain? What does it feel like? Is it achy or sharp or throbbing or burning? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What have you tried so far? Sometimes they come in and then and it's a clean slate and we have a lot to work with. And sometimes they come in and say, doc, you're my last hope. I've seen everyone. I've had injections. I've had surgery. I've had therapy. I've had medicine. Help me. And then I start sweating a little bit because I have to figure this out. Um, so by the time I've gotten a history from the patient, I have kind of a one, two, three in my mind of what I think could be going on. And then I do the physical exam and sometimes I'm spot on and sometimes it's totally different. And I'll tell a patient after the exam, I was like, you know, I really thought this was going to be a hip because he said it hurts when you cross your legs to put on your socks and shoes and it hurts in your groin. But when I tested you, your L5 muscles were weak. So I think this is actually something coming from your spine. Now let's take a look at the MRI that you had, you know, a couple of years ago when you had a disc problem and let's see if that makes sense. So starting off with finding out what they've done to treat their pain so far. So we know what's worked and what hasn't worked and kind of going back to our discussion of physical therapy. A lot of times I'll tell patients, well, I think you have, I think you'll do well with physical therapy. I'm going to write you a prescription. They'll, they'll say, I did physical therapy already. It didn't work. And then you say, okay, sorry, what, could you oops, say that again? sorry, Siri started talking to me here. I, I thought I was young, but I don't, haven't figured out how to use my new Apple watch yet. Um, so I lost my trainer. Oh, so they'll say, um, I've done physical therapy and it didn't work. I'll say, well, what did you do in physical therapy? Well, I got a massage and the therapist stretched me out and that was it. I was like, well, okay, you didn't really do physical therapy. So finding out what they did already is an important factor to deciding what next steps I'll take. And then if I find any red flags on their MRI, that could be an indication to get imaging sooner than later. So trouble, weight bearing, weakness, changes in their reflexes. Um, those are signs that I'll get an, uh, an image sooner than later. If I can find weakness on exam, so a lot of times, you know, most of my days about telling people why they have to strengthen their glutes, I think the glutes are the most important muscle of the core. And so I'll show them an exercise that I want them to do and, or I'll show them how when I put them in position and activate their glutes, how weak it really is, then they can understand how physical therapy can be helpful. If we can make this stronger, if we can make your hamstrings a little bit looser, if we can get your balance improved, this is what we can expect to improve. Um, if a patient has any sort of red flags, if they've had trauma to the area, like they fell and they have a lot of bony tenderness, that would be an indication to get imaging sooner than later. Or if they've done a good course of six weeks of physical therapy and we're not starting to see progress, that's when I'll probably order imaging. Um, if we see on an x-ray that they have bone on bone arthritis, meaning the cartilage has totally worn away, and we've tried conservative treatments, that's when we'll think about sending them to see a surgeon. I'm not a surgeon. I make a living keeping people away from surgery, but I would be a bad non-surgeon if I didn't recognize when surgery was the right thing. Um, so I refer my patients to surgery when I think it's appropriate. And from the other side of the perspective, surgeons in general like to see patients who might need surgery. So a lot of times if you call HSS and say, I have knee pain, I want to see a surgeon. They'll say, well, have you seen anyone yet? Maybe you should see a non- operative doctor first, which at HSS are physiatrists, primary care sports doctors, neurologists, and rheumatologists in general. Um, and then depending on what that non-surgeon finds, they may refer you to a surgeon. So kind of a long answer to your simple question, I would say if I see red flags or um, if they've had recent trauma or if they have not seen some improvement with a, at least a six-week course of physical therapy, that's when we'll think about getting imaging that might be as simple as an x-ray. And we can see a lot on an x-ray, especially when we're looking at a joint. If uh, we're more concerned about a tendon problem or a ligament injury, and an x-ray doesn't show us the information that we're looking for, then sometimes an MRI or an ultrasound or a CT scan can be, uh, can be more helpful in that regard. And I have one more question. Um, if someone comes to you with uh, leg pain or back pain, and we've, we've identified that they need to go to PT, they do PT for six weeks, they come back and then get some imaging. Um, what are you looking for on the image that will determine if they're going to be a surgical patient or if they just need an injection and need to continue PT? 
Yeah, super question. So it all depends on what we think the source of pain. So let's use hip arthritis as an example. So they have maybe some limited range of motion and pain in the groin. We try a physical therapy. Maybe we make a little bit of progress. Maybe we're not making much progress at all. I'd probably start with an x-ray at that point. If the x-ray shows that the joint space is preserved, meaning the cartilage hasn't worn away enough that we can see on an x-ray, we can't see cartilage on an x-ray, but we can tell a little bit about how healthy is how healthy it is by how much space there is between the bones. So when somebody says they have bone on bone arthritis, that means that the cartilage has totally worn away and there's no more cushion between the bones. We can see bone on bone arthritis really great on an x-ray. So let's say you come in and you know your hip range of motion is not good and you're not improving with physical therapy. We do an x-ray, we see bone on bone arthritis and MRI is not gonna help us any more than that. Um, whereas maybe you come in with weakness and we try to get it stronger with physical therapy. It's just not getting stronger. You have some reflex changes. We'll say, well, you know what? Maybe this is a nerve problem. And maybe that's why the communication of the nerve to the muscle is interrupted. And that's why no matter how hard you try, you just can't get stronger. Then an MRI of the lumbar spine or the low back could be really helpful. So it all depends on what we expect to see in terms of our history and physical, what kind of progress we've made with the physical therapy. And then, you you know, a lot of times we'll start with an x-ray, partly because it gives us good information, partly because a lot of times insurance will require that you've had an x-ray and six weeks of physical therapy before they'll approve more advanced imaging like an MRI. Um, but depending on what we see there, then we can think about different injection options. In general, for an arthritic joint, for example, whether that's the hip or knee or ankle injections in general can be helpful. Injections don't change arthritis. They don't change cartilage loss, but they can change the symptoms that you experience from it. In general, for an arthritic joint, we can do a steroid injection. Steroid is anti-inflammatory. Um, it usually works, but it's also usually temporary. It can last three months or six months, sometimes much longer, unfortunately, sometimes less than that amount of time. Um, sometimes the more severe the arthritis, the less the injection helps or the less it lasts. Um, other things that we sometimes inject are gel injections or visco supplementation. We do that most often in the knee. And then we also sometimes do PRP, platelet rich plasma, where we take the patient's blood, spin it in a centrifuge and inject parts of that into a joint or sometimes even into a tendon. Um, so depending on what kind of progress we've made with the initial uh, course of treatment, conservative care like medications and physical therapy, and what we see on their imaging, um, injections sometimes become an option. Okay, so it, those are all of our scripted questions. We have 78 participants uh, on the Zoom right now. Um, if anyone would like to ask questions of us, we have plenty of time. Um, go ahead and ask in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to freestyle some questions for Dr. Barsoom that she is not ready for, which is always fun. So um, what are your more challenging diagnoses to treat? What are the ones that you're like, oh, we need to we need to do a comprehensive workup on this? What what takes the longest? It's that patient that comes in and says, I've had pain for 20 years and I've seen a neurologist and I've seen a physiatrist that had an injection. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was in my back. I'm not sure. Well, did it help? I don't know. And I had an MRI. It's 12 years old. What do you think of it? And I did physical therapy. I don't want to do that anymore. And I just want a quick fix. That can be really tough to break down all that information. And sometimes, you know, it's hard because we see a lot of patients in a day and I want to respect my patient's time and stay on schedule as much as I can. But sometimes a patient encounter just takes longer that you, than you've allotted and you kind of just accept it in the moment and say, okay, let's dig our teeth in, let's get a good history, let's get a good physical exam. And that's how the patient can then trust you, right? Because a lot of times patients will say, um, this is the most thorough exam I've ever had. I've had this pain, I've seen all these doctors, but nobody's actually put their hands on me and tried to figure it out. So when a patient comes in and says, you know, I've had this pain for so long and I've seen so many doctors, those are the ones that can be a little bit more, uh, more challenging to break through. And then once you kind of dig in a little deeper and start to peel away the layers, then it can uh, sort of, the, the waters get less muddy. Okay. Um, I apologize to the group because I was 
under the impression they were all in the chat I was in, and there are 20 questions. So I'm going to get through the other questions and see how that goes. So um, just going in time order, um, Linda asks, uh, I am recovering slowly from my first ever attack of sciatica. I am still feeling weak and numb after six weeks. Is there any chance that these sensations will become chronic? So great question. And I'll, since we have a lot of questions, I'll try to answer them as succinctly as I can. Um, so when you have a pinched nerve or sciatica in the back, um, the symptoms can be pain, tingling, weakness, numbness. In general, numbness is the symptom that recovers the slowest, no matter what treatment you have, whether it gets better with medications or physical therapy or injections, or even surgery, numbness is what lingers the longest. However, if you're still feeling weak, I would definitely follow up with your doctor to have that evaluated further. Okay. Um, Linda, if that didn't answer your question, please ask a follow-up. Um, Rebecca asks, uh, what is the most common cause of hamstring glute pain when sitting and how would be the best way to treat it? So hamstring pain is pain kind of at the sits bones, right where your butt lands on the chair. Um, a lot of times patients will describe that as um, an achy pain with sitting or with stairs that gets better if they stand or that gets better if they kind of sit leaning away from that side. Um, strengthening the hamstring is definitely the way to go. Um, so physical therapy can be helpful there. Hamstrings and glutes are both tendon problems. So steroid, sometimes not so helpful there. So that PRP that we talked about could be something to think about for a chronic tendon problem that doesn't get better with, uh, with physical therapy. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, from Ivy. My husband and I have been getting knots on the outside of our calf at night that wakes us up. And sometimes it's so painful we need to, to massage it for several minutes before it goes away. We had heard tonic water can be helpful. Do you have a suggestions on how to get rid of this issue? That's a really great question. So spinal stenosis can cause cramping in the legs or those kind of knot or muscle spasm sensations. But spinal stenosis is worse with walking and gets better when you sit down and really should not cause those symptoms at all when you're supine, when you're laying down. A lot of times muscle spasms and aches in the legs while sleeping can be uh, related to dehydration. So most people who think they're drinking enough water probably still are not drinking enough water. Not a lot of people drink as much as they're supposed to. Um, sometimes vitamin deficiency can lead to that sensation as well. Magnesium supplementation can help, but you should always talk to your primary care doctor before starting something like that. Um, and then other things like neuropathy or restless leg can cause those kind of sensations as well. So seeing a neurologist could be helpful if you've talked to your primary care doctor and increased your water intake and those symptoms are persisting. Okay. Uh, Donna states uh, her legs ache and throb when she's in bed. She has extensive spinal fusion and hip arthritis. Are these related? 100%, right? So the hip and spine go together so much. And when you've had fusion of the spine, meaning there's less range of motion in those joints, it puts more strain on the joints above and below. Um, and so the hip can definitely be related. The same way having hip arthritis and limited range of motion in the hip can cause increased pain in the lower back. Um, those patients can be a little bit of a challenge too in figuring out you know, where the source of pain is. Is it more hip or more spine? That's referring to one or the other. Um, so I would definitely see a doctor um, to have that evaluated further because even if you've had spinal fusion, sometimes injections can be helpful. Definitely physical therapy can be helpful. You know, it's hard when you have had a lot of surgery on the spine. Spinal surgery is tough, um, but we can definitely usually make things better, if not make it go away. Okay. Susan asks, uh, can sciatic type pain in the left leg be caused by a combination of dextroscoliosis and valgus in the left knee? I also have osteoarthritis in my knees and back, which worsen with changes in the weather. Great. So scoliosis, meaning a curvature in the spine, can definitely predispose you to developing a pinched nerve based on the space where the nerves are exiting from the spine. Um, having a valgus alignment of the knee, meaning the knee comes inwards um, instead of being straight, may be related to the scoliosis in a um, sort of compensation that you've developed over time, may be related to a knee pain in and of itself. Um, but the combination of the two can certainly be aggravating to one another. 
physical therapy to work on strengthening because muscular imbalances in scoliosis are so significant. So physical therapy is not likely to improve the curvature of the spine, but to help with some of the muscular imbalance um, could definitely be helpful for you. Okay. So this is from an anonymous attendee, and I think they're the same anonymous person asking two questions. So I'm just going to group them together um, because the answer probably would be the same. Um, I have pain down the shin and into the ankle and foot. It lasts maybe a minute or so, disappears. It does not occur on a regular basis. Is it possible that it's coming from the back? So pain that goes down the front of the leg into the foot could be from the spine. Um, sometimes you can get, if it's happening only with activities, it sounds like it could be like a shin sweat kind of thing too, which should get better with exercise um, and stretching. But if it's pain that goes down the front of the leg to the ankle and foot, that certainly could be a pinched L4 nerve or L5, depending on what part of the leg it, it's in. Um, I usually tell patients if it's a pain that happens very sporadically, it's not very bothersome, it doesn't last very long, then I'm not too concerned. But if it's starting to become more uh, prominent, meaning it's happening more frequently, it's interrupting activities, it's waking you up from sleep, then definitely something to get checked out. Okay. Um... IVS again, uh, she mentions that she has iliotibial band syndrome for about 40 years since an injury in her 20s. Uh, the side of her legs contract and you can feel the knots along the side of the leg. Each knot becomes tender and it can be very uncomfortable while sitting or sleeping. She's tried stretching and would like to get rid of the issue. Any suggestions? So once you've had a chronic pain like that, it can be really hard to get, get rid of it. I tell patients, if you've had pain for 20 years, six weeks of physical therapy is not going to make it go away. Um, I would recommend trying some foam rolling of the ITB. That can be really helpful. That manual pressure can help get the, um, the tendon to relax. And then sometimes if it's if you're just working on stretching the ITB, ITB, but then not strengthening the muscles that form the IT, so the gluteus maximus and the tensor fasciolata at the hip, um, then you can get those chronic sensations of the IT band as well. So I would work on some foam rolling of the IT band and then strengthening at the hip. Okay. Um, this is a good question um, by anonymous attendee, uh, knee pain, um, meniscus or a tracking issue, avoid stairs or push through? Great question. So it's hard to avoid stairs in life. Um, so I think once you get stronger, so just having a meniscus tear does not mean you have to have surgery on your meniscus, right? 25 years ago, we did a lot more meniscus surgeries than we do now because we realized that those patients who had meniscus surgery sometimes got worse and they develop more arthritis pretty quickly over time. Um, so you can work through and treat a meniscus tear, even one that's really, really painful with conservative treatments. Most of the time, physical therapy, sometimes an injection to help if, they're, if it's really swollen or something like that. Um, so I would say building up strength, again, knee pain symptoms get a lot better when you get your hips stronger, will make you uh, much better able to uh, to navigate the stairs, especially if you're having patellar tendon tracking issues, that comes from that ITB tightness and then weakness of the glute. Okay, um, this is another really good question from Denise. Uh, if you have arthritis in your knee, do you need to have a knee replacement, especially after already having um, an arthroscopy on your knee? Great question. So an arthroscopy is that sort of minimally invasive surgery that's often done for a meniscus tear. Um, you do not have to have a knee replacement if you have knee arthritis. What I tell patients, again, I told you guys I like the number three. So you have to have severe arthritis to have a joint replacement. Studies show if you have a joint replacement before you have severe arthritis, you tend to do worse or you have you know, more chronic pain or more at risk for chronic pain after the surgery. So you have to have severe arthritis. You have to have severe pain. Some people are walking around with severe arthritis without having a lot of pain. And you have to have tried conservative treatments that don't provide significant pain relief. So just having the arthritis does not mean you automatically need to have a joint replacement. I would probably get an x-ray to see how severe the arthritis is. I would try physical therapy and then think about those injections as a treatment option as well. And when things just aren't getting better and you've adequately tried conservative treatment, that's when I would get a surgical consultation. Okay. So, um, Dr. Burson, we're at time. However, there's about, uh, we're about halfway through the questions. I'm okay staying if you are. Um, I'm okay if the moderators say it's okay. Moderate. Yeah, that's okay. We can do a few more if you like. Sounds good. Sure. Sounds good. So maybe five more minutes of rapid fire here. Sounds good. Okay. 
Uh, Lucille's been diagnosed with sciatica from the L5 disc. It causes pain mostly at night. She's tired of taking drugs. Is there an exercise or something she can do? She's been to many doctors and they don't help her. She's been suffering with it for years. Can we help? Yes. Um, so absolutely exercise can be helpful. Exercise doesn't change a disc herniation. In general, discs can get better with time. Your body has uh, can send cleanup cells called macrophages to clean up some of the disc material that's pushed out where it's not supposed to be. Surgery might be indicated for her if she really has had pain for so long, it's interrupting sleep and activities. If she's tried physical therapy and injections, surgery definitely could be, um, could be indicated for her. Um, but if she's not had a good course of physical therapy recently, if she's not had epidural injections, then um, those are definitely options to help get her some pain relief. Okay, we're gonna try and get through as many of these as possible, because um, these are good. Um, <laughs> When your physical therapist stretches you, is it okay that it can really hurt? Is it doing damage or is it beneficial? That's a great question and it's a fine line, right? So I don't always believe in no pain, no gain. If it's severe pain, you should always be providing that feedback to the therapist. Like, I don't like how this feels or it doesn't feel good or this is reproducing my symptoms. So I would say severe pain during a stretch is not okay. A little bit of muscle tightness or aching, a little bit of soreness after physical therapy, meaning you've exercised muscles that maybe you haven't in a while is okay as long as it resolves pretty quickly. But if you're having severe pain, I would definitely give the therapist that feedback. Okay. Let me come back up. All right. So what type of doctor should I see if I have multiple problems in different parts of my body? I have fibromyalgia, spinal stenosis, osteoporosis, and bilateral neuropathy. The pain varies from one spot to another in intensity, and she's had two recent falls. So sounds like a typical physiatry patient. Um, physiatrists, are, I think physiatrists are great, but maybe I'm a little bit biased. Um, but we treat patients as a whole. You know, you sound like somebody who needs not more than one doctor, right? If you have fibromyalgia, you have peripheral neuropathy, you have spinal stenosis, you may need a physiatrist and a rheumatologist and a neurologist. Um, I, I say in situations like that, having one doctor who's kind of the captain of the ship and then who may refer you and work with other specialists. But I think a physiatrist is definitely a great place to start. Okay. Um, Sai has been diagnosed with axonal nerve damage. Is there anything he can do to stimulate the nerve to regenerate? Great question. Um, nerves regenerate on their own, but very, very, very slowly. Um, there's some thought that some vitamins like vitamin B6 can be helpful for nerve growth. There's thoughts that anti-inflammatories can be helpful to prevent ongoing irritation of the nerves. Um, but nerve injury is very tough. One important thing is to remove any factors that are causing the nerve injury. Like in peripheral neuropathy, most often it's diabetes. Getting your blood sugar under control if you have diabetic neuropathy does not reverse the neuropathy that's there, but it can slow the progression of it. So one important thing when you have a nerve problem like that is to try to identify where it's coming from and, I, and remove any of those sources that you can. Okay, we have time for two more. I'm going to group one of these together. Um, Diane asks if Achilles tendonitis could be reversed. Um, and also, I'm not sure if this is the same Diane or a different one. Um, and a new pain in her heel, um, her primary said it could be plantar fasciitis. How do I reverse it? Great. So in general, it's a, it's a great question, right? So if I get an MRI and I see Achilles tendonitis and I treat the patient with physical therapy and their pain goes away and I get a new MRI, I might see the Achilles tendon has improved. I might see it looks exactly the same. And in that circumstance, I'd say, okay, you're healed. Keep doing the things that you're doing. Again, we treat the symptoms, not what we see on the MRI. So can it be reversed in terms of the pain that it's causing? Absolutely. Can it be reversed in terms of what it looks like on the imaging? Maybe. And then the plantar fasciitis, a lot of times simple stretching, like with a frozen water bottle, rolling your foot on that, especially first thing in the morning, can be a great start for treatment of plantar fasciitis. It's important to look at your shoes and think about an orthotic for that kind of problem. All right. And then Susan is a 95-year-old in good health, but weakness and pain in the right leg. Has a bit of arthritis in the right hip, tried an injection, and it didn't help. Also has spinal stenosis and terrible cramps at night. Any suggestions? Uh, physical therapy, for sure. And good for you, Susan, for being a healthy 95-year-old. A lot of my patients are in their 80s and 90s, so I love to see it. Um, I think if injections, you know, injections are nice. I love doing injections, 
They're fun. They make people feel better, but sometimes they're not the answer for everything. So I would say seeing a physical therapist to try to identify where the symptoms are coming from, because having an injection in your hip is not going to help if your problem is coming from spinal stenosis. So I think trying to get a better understanding of where the symptoms really are coming from so that we can tailor our treatment um, is the way to go. So there's still a few more um, uh, questions in the chat, but I think we should stop here because I want to summarize just kind of what we spoke about. If I didn't get to your questions, I apologize. You can email me. My last name is Goonan, G-O-O-N-A-N, um, and the email is Goonan, B, my first initial, at hss.edu. Feel free to email me. Not enough people email me. I get emails about like Wi-Fi being out. I never hear from patients. So go ahead and email me as much as you want. Um, basically, in summary, what I'm hearing from you, Dr. Barsoom, is that if you've had pain for more than six weeks, you should get it looked at. It could be a couple of different causes. You have a way that you could kind of go through deductive reasoning and figure out where it's coming from. And there's treatments based on getting the right diagnosis. And if you're not getting better, it's probably not the right diagnosis. And that's why they should come to you. Um, I personally love being someone's second or third therapist because I know what hasn't worked already and I go in the opposite direction. Um, Anything you would add to that? No, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to do what I do. And uh, it's nice when patients get better. Sometimes we don't make the pain go away, but if we can decrease how much pain medicine you're needing, or if we can make you more able to do the things that you enjoy or more able to sleep more comfortably, even if there's still some pain that's left over, that still is a victory for me. And there's definitely a lot of different ways to treat pain coming from the leg and something that worked for your neighbor may not be the right thing for you. So I think the most important thing with treating leg pain or pain anywhere is to identify the source of pain, because if you don't know what you're treating, you're not gonna have a lot of luck getting better. I agree with that. Um, I also uh, would like everyone to know that um, with the pandemic kind of turning the world upside down, it is actually, we in Westchester here, we have a very long wait list to get in to see us, but it's a very good time to see the doctors and the physical therapists in Manhattan because they're usually the ones who have the four week wait list. Now you can get in to see them on the soon side. So if you're putting something off just because you think it's gonna take a long time to get in, it's not true. You can definitely get in to see someone in the city within the next couple of weeks before the, before the new year probably. Um, Bonnie, anything to add? No, that was great. Thank you guys so much. You're great for staying after to answer questions. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you can always email us at community education too. It's communityed at hss.edu. Um, and thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Thanks everyone. Have a great hey, night. Everybody. Have a good night guys. Thanks, Brian.